Holy God, your word comes to us, Jesus Christ, Emmanuel. Holy word, you cross every border meant to shut you out. Holy wisdom, speak to us in the word read and proclaimed. Hearing, may we dream your dreams and faithfully follow wherever you lead. In your triune name we pray, amen. Our second scripture is from Matthew, the second chapter, verses 13 through 23. When they had gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, he said. Take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. So he got up, took the child and his mother during the night, and left for Egypt, where he stayed until the death of Herod. And so was fulfilled what the Lord has said through the prophet, Out of Egypt I called my son. When Herod realized that he had been outwitted by the Magi, he was furious, and he gave orders to kill all the boys in Bethlehem and its vicinity, who were two years old and under. In accordance with the time he had learned from the Magi, then what was said through the prophet Jeremiah was fulfilled. A voice is heard in Ramah, weeping and great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children and refusing to be comforted because they are no more. After Herod died, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt and said, Get up, take the child and his mother, and go to the land of Israel, for those who were trying to take the child's life are dead. So he got up, took the child and his mother, and went to the land of Israel. But, he, but when he heard that Archelaus was reigning in Judea in place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. Having been warned in a dream, he withdrew to the district of Galilee, and he went and lived in a town called Nazareth. So was fulfilled what was said through the prophets, that he would be called a Nazarene. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So um, a man got a brand new Mercedes for Christmas and he took it out for a spin on the interstate. It was a convertible and the top was down. The breeze was blowing through his hair so he decided he would open it up to see what it would do. And the needle hit 80 miles an hour, then 90, then 100, then 110, then 120, and even 130. All of a sudden, he looked up in his rearview mirror, and there was that flashing red and blue light behind him. He said to himself, they can't catch this Mercedes. He got it up to 150 miles per hour, but the lights were still behind him. He thought to himself, I'm going to be in big trouble if I don't pull over. So he did. Well, the police officer came up to him and took his license without saying a word, examined it, looked at the car, and said, Mr. I've been working all night, and this is my last pullover, and I'm exhausted. I don't feel like filling out more paperwork, so I'm going to give you an offer. If you can give me an excuse for driving that way, the way you were driving I've never heard in my 27-year career, I'll let you go. The man thought fast and said, well, officer, last week my wife ran off with a police officer and I was afraid that it was you trying to bring her back. So I hope you don't have to return any of your gifts this year. 
So do you still have your Christmas decorations up? Some people take theirs down right after Christmas. Others, like Richard and I, like to leave ours up until New Year's. It's nice to enjoy those 12 days between Christmas Day and Epiphany that we will be celebrating next Sunday, by the way, to appreciate the span of time that forms a bridge between the birth of Jesus and his presentation to the world as its Savior. We know so little about the years between Bethlehem and Jesus' appearance at the Jordan River, asking to be baptized by John. It seems appropriate that we should pause here on the last Sunday of the season of Christmas to consider how Jesus got from the manger to Nazareth, the village where he would grow to adulthood. Maybe you came to worship this morning, though, with the hope of holding on to that Christmas joy just a little bit longer. Sing one more carol. Smile at the image of a sweet infant nestled into the manger for a moment. Or maybe you came ready for something fresh. After all, Christmas is almost so last year, and we are almost ushering in 2020. Whatever your expectations were this morning, you probably weren't necessarily hoping for the somber story we find in Matthew's Gospel. It's not one that often makes our Christmas lessons and carols list. Rather than a beautiful picture to adorn with glitter on a holiday card, Matthew's Gospel, particularly in these verses, presents a much bleaker image of what followed the birth of Christ, perhaps even foreshadowing the events that will come some 30 years later. These verses are a sobering reality and wake-up call to the harshness of the world. This is a hard story for hard times, but maybe that's just the point for Matthew. The richness for this story is that God came into a broken world to bring wholeness. These verses speak to real people who knew the immediate threats and inherent dangers of one who claimed to be the Messiah that he would face in the world. Early believers knew just how high those stakes were. They were living them too. The examples of darkness and danger don't just lurk in this text. They leap from the pages and haunt our dreams. The examples of darkness and danger in our world act in very much the same way. Matthew's Gospel reminds us that the story of Christ's birth is not some idyllic fairy tale or Disney movie with singing animals around the manger. The story is real. It's a scary, gritty, and fraught with all of the struggles we face in the world. The Holy Family is on the run. From the very beginning, they are refugees fleeing for their very lives. I imagine these moments had a hushed sense of urgency for Mary and Joseph, perhaps trying to pull the few things they had for the baby together under the cover of night, hoping for the guiding light of a star to illumine their new path. Reading this text just after Christmas, I was struck by the reports of the ongoing conflict in Syria and the trauma for the children there. Refugees who have been displaced by politics, war, and poverty struggle with the same fears and anxiety that Joseph and Mary must have experienced, as they did whatever they could to protect the young child, Jesus. Suddenly the carol's melody, but little jo Lord Jesus, no crying he makes, takes a darker turn. Imagine this couple, a bundled newborn in Mary's arms, making their way across the desert to Egypt, 
a route that Google Maps estimates to be 148 hours walking. We talk about the difficult journey they made from Jerusalem to Bethlehem, but it was only a glimpse of this harrowing path that they would now take. It was one marked by fear, no doubt with Joseph constantly looking over his shoulder at every turn or pause. Matthew's gospel paints a pretty bleak picture. And yet, it is from this darkness that the Lord comes into a world like this, where terror reigns and people are fleeing in fear, the Lord comes. Into a world like this, where mothers sob endlessly at the loss of children, where grief overwhelms us, the Lord comes. Into a world like this where dreams seem dashed and nightmares become reality, the Lord comes. The light of the world has come, John's gospel proclaims. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness shall not overcome it. Matthew's gospel brings us this good news, too, with the promise of the dawning of a new day. The fears and concerns and threats in the world may be great, but God's plans are even greater. The end of our passage this morning ushers ushers in the promise of a new era for God's people, hinged on a fulfillment of the promises of old. This is what Matthew is known for, the ability to link the past with the future and show his readers that God has been present through it all. In many ways, I think Matthew's telling of the story makes our Christmas complete and helps us take Christmas with us into the new year. Long after the tinsel and trees have been packed away, Matthew's story of Christ's winding road stands as a witness to how committed God truly is to being with us and, and, and the lengths at which God will go to bring grace into the world and to us. Matthew's story reminds us to look for signs of God's presence, not just in the shining moments, but in the difficult ones. And he assures us that God will be there. These verses proclaim that there truly is no situation in life which our God does not understand. Through Christ, God has experienced all that life in this world entails including those moments that are hidden in shadows and darkness, trapped by fear and grief. This is where the light of the world begins ministry, where we need it the most. There are words of promise from Matthew that return us to the hope of prophet Isaiah, who spoke of God's steadfast love in this way, saying, And he became their savior in all their distress. It was no messenger or angel, but his presence that saved them. In his love and in his pity, he redeemed them. He lifted them up and carried them all the days of old. This is good news to hear as we begin a new calendar year and wonder what 2020 will have in store. God will still be there with us, no matter where the road may lead us. And if we find ourselves on a very different path than before, in a place that is totally outside our comfort zone, God will be there too. In those places in our lives where we have anxiety or fear, God is there. 
in those places where tears flow and grief is great, God is there. And God will see us through, even if it takes us over the river and through the woods. God will not abandon us. Only Joseph saw the angel. Only Joseph had the dreams. Only Joseph knew the magnitude of his task to protect the Messiah from the dangers of Herod's henchmen. Just as Mary did not argue with the angel who told her she would give birth to the Savior of the world, Joseph did not argue with the angel who said, Go. He just went. He answered God's call with action. God is calling us today. He's calling us to be a voice for peace justice, and grace. He's calling us to challenge the way things are in this world, to stand against evil when we see it, to be the presence of God for those who suffer violence and abuse, to let them know that God is with us, Emmanuel. As we become aware of God's constant working in our lives, we are called to participate in that work. Whether we are sent to Egypt or Nazareth, whether we are called to feed the hungry or clothe the naked or heal the sick, whether we are tasked with comforting the bereaved or spreading hope to those who have lost it, God calls us. May we, like Joseph, answer that call without hesitation, knowing that God is always with us. Emmanuel. Amen.